Paul Carter's been a regular visitor to, to our community over the years. Uh, Paul's a historian, writer, philosopher, and an artist who's currently chair in crea Creative Place Research at Deakin University. He's also the director of the Deakin Creative and uh, De of the or deputy director of the Centre for Memory, Imagination, and Invention. Paul's authored many books, mainly concerned with Australian history and Australian places and their identity. Um, most recently, Ground Truthing, uh, which is um, an examination of the the place that we know as the, the Mallee, uh, and in particular the relationship of the poet John Shaw Nielsen uh, and Jowie, or Mac as he's known, an Indigenous character. Paul's particularly interested in the poetics of placemaking and public space design and the applications of this sort of creative research to community renewal, strategic planning and policy for formulation. And I can say that he's definitely a friend of this community with his assistance to projects currently underway here, uh, particularly in relation to the Old Mildura Base Hospital, uh, and of course as a, an artist supporter of Palimpsest, and I'd encourage you to go and see uh, his, his work um, uneasily along the sand, which is a collaborative work um, down at the old homestead. So, uh, and I think this one probably follows Paul around like an old dog. Um, he, uh, he's also responsible for the development and design of Nirimnu, the elaborate surface treatment that many of us will have walked across at Federation Square in Melbourne. So with that, Paul, um, I'd like to introduce you and welcome to Palimpsest number eight, Paul Carter. I've called this talk uh, Connections That Function. And what I wanted to do is to introduce you to um, a 19th century um, sometime squatter um, by the name of James Dawson. I keep on th it's actually quite appropriate to ask, you know, who is James Dawson on the sort of James Boag kind of, or Bogue, whatever you pronounce it, um, analogy, because he was, actually was a failed distiller from Scotland. So <laughs> he does actually have a kind of um, an alcoholic connection. James Dawson established um, a kind of mixed sheep and cattle run in southwestern Victoria around about 1846 after coming out from Scotland. Um, he had a um, very long association with uh, the, sort of the Warrnambool, um, Southern Grampians um, area, um, something over 50 years. He was very long lived um, and, in fact, not dying until virtually the turn of the century. Um, and I wanted to um, discuss some um, investigations that um, a group of us have been making into his heritage, his legacy. Why would I do that here? Um, that's really what I want to come to, because I think that, um, particularly in the context of the last um, presentation, um, it's not only the case that we need to think about uh, collective uh, agents of collaboration, in other words, different segments or stakeholders or parts of the community that will come together to produce better outcomes for the environment and therefore for ourselves. Um, it's also uh, the case that we individually have to achieve more integrated understandings of the different parts of our brains and bodies and our relationships with those around us. James Dawson, um, it's a proposition of our research was exemplary in that respect. Um, he was somebody who brought together um, in, uh, and with extraordinary poise, common sense, and courage, uh, a set of interests. In other words, he was uh, a proto-maker um, of better futures, um, and a large part of his career in the Western District, his writings, uh, more importantly, perhaps even his actions, uh, were exemplary of somebody who refused to allow uh, environment to be separated from issues of social justice, uh, refused to allow the history of invasion uh, to forget um, and indeed to supersede um, fully functioning indigenous cultures, uh, who was concerned for animals, who was concerned for the trees. Uh, above all, he was a public intellectual. Um, it's interesting, um, not that this is a a particular merit point, but um, he, there's no, no record to, of him whatsoever in Camperdown, which is his hometown for 40 or 50 years. 
Uh, the background to wanting to talk about him today is, again, another concept which um, I think is um, implicit and explicit in you know, Badger's art, for example, and probably um, is characteristic of any developed philosophical system. It's the concept of a creative region. And you can see already in that term we're bringing together arts and sciences, both of which hypothesize possible states which replenish what has become eroded through instrumentalist reason, ideology, prejudice. Creative regions are regions understood as generative. Um, and we're all familiar with the uncreative region. That's the one that federal governments like to impose on us, where we are always at the bottom of the food chain awaiting something to be handed down, which generally speaking is a kind of monocultural response to a complex situation that further reduces our capacity to think for ourselves. Creative regions reverse that. So in the book Ground Truthing, um, which uh, I brought out last year, uh, I tried to make the case for the Mali as a creative region. And um, a feature of a creative region is that it's understood relationally, that is, as um, many, many layers, palimpsest, you could say, of journeys. Um, all journeys are poetic journeys. Um, poetic thinking is essentially the relating of places that were formerly far apart. Um, all poems are basically regions. Um, they're kinds of poetic geography. So to think about a region, as I did through the words of John Shaw Nielsen, was partly to reinterpret Nielsen as an ecologist um, and as a stitcher together of um, a, a rapidly sort of fragmenting environment. Um, creative regions are also situational. In other words, you can't just take what you find in the Mali and dump it down, say, in the Western District. Um, there are fundamentally different um, regional imperatives, uh, cultural histories, environmental um, orders that operate in these related uh, but different regions. So creative regions are situational. That is to say that they come from something, they are kicked off by something, uh, they build around certain kinds of nuclei. And for me, in writing about the Mali, uh, for a whole set of reasons to do with um, uh, white settler investments and indigenous investments, I focused on Lake Tyrol, which is somewhere south of, of, the, of um, Mildura, not least because of the ambiguity of the word Tyrol, which um, is variously rendered in English to mean something like void, space, dark, heaven, expanse. Uh, it's a term that um, is taken probably from indigenous languages, um, but its sense is a bicultural sense. In other words, it emerges for us now in translation where it's been assimilated to ideas of the open, uh, a place of possibility, a place of possible meeting. So in that sense, the, 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 the myth, if you like, the creative myth for uh, that part of the Mali was situational. It took advantage of a particular um, feature within the landscape. But the other feature about creative regions is that they are interregional. In other words, they're not um, top-down regions that have a kind of, um, what can we say, a sort of policy fence around them. You know, that it stops at the Loddon or it stops at the Goulburn or something, or it stops down river from particular irrigation plantation. Regions are interregional. Um, so my view is it's a bit like the turtle story, that it's regions all the way down. So it doesn't really matter whether you're in Manhattan, um, the Mali is to some extent a region you can talk to, and it works the other way, increasingly probably. What I mean by that is uh, regions um, are larger versions of uh, journeys, um, and particularly as Dawson illustrates, uh, journeys always involve coming from somewhere else. And I suppose uh, so much of the pain and horror of uh, modern history has been about uh, the attempt to try and put gates across those journeys and then to fight over who, which side of them you should be, rather than actually realizing that the journey is not a line, it's a constant negotiation. It's a constant diplomatic process of understanding and opening. Uh, it's about, obviously, respect. Um, a creative region, then, implies a certain practice. Um, it implies a certain attitude or disposition towards those around you. It implies, in the case of migrants like myself, taking ownership not only uh, of places that we have come from, reflecting on that, 
it also uh, understands something about the unceded ground where we find ourselves and the processes of affiliation um, that need to be uh, undertaken uh, in order to start a conversation where uh, somewhere in that kind of friction between um, indigenous and non-indigenous Australians, uh, other voices also start to emerge. Um, creative regions then have all these characteristics and I tried to, to talk about that. Um, and it brings me to James Dawson. Who is James Dawson, apart from being a failed distiller's son? Uh, James Dawson is, to begin with, um, a set of relationships. Um, and probably uh, one of the key relationships that uh, we're trying to understand more about is his relationship with his daughter, Isabella. Um, Isabella was born um, on uh, the, the first station that they established uh, in Victoria on the Upper Yarra in the late um, 1840s. Uh, sorry, earlier, well, mid-1840s. Later in the 1840s, they made this extraordinary biblical migration with their cattle uh, down to um, a property that they took up um, southwest of the Grampians, where uh, James Dawson became uh, an employer of uh, indigenous shepherds, uh, indigenous stockmen, uh, indigenous uh, hand workers, uh, and also... Um, employed Aboriginal women uh, as domestic labour. Uh, the um, the uh, finance ledgers for all those um, interactions, those employments, uh, were kept for about 70 years and they were destroyed in a fire. But in itself it was remarkable that uh, he insisted on written contracts for every single one of those people employed. Um, Isabella grew up speaking um, um, Japwarong um, as, a, as a Kulin language and um, she was responsible for compiling over a long period between about 1862 when uh, she would have been, I'm not sure, about 19 or 20 and a decade later when she published the results of her investigation into the local indigenous languages um, she was involved almost on a daily basis in getting the language. And there's some remarkable photographs of her sitting in the garden with uh, the people that worked on the property discussing um, the different languages and trying to get them. So it was a classic colonial moment at one level. But as one de delves deeper into the vocabularies that were collected, you see that they are completely uh, sabotaging what you would expect um, to have happened from a scientific point of view. Um, the vocabularies do not attempt to place a theory over what is being performed and recorded on a day-to-day -day basis, but rather go out of their way to record individual speech differences, accents, pronunciations, and indeed to bring alive um, a, a place of meeting or interaction in a way that completely sabotaged the great sort of grammatical uh, prob you know, uh, ambition of Victorian science, which is to reduce the language to order. You know. So that's the first interesting relationship because James Dawson um, oversights this and encourages it and <coughs> 11 years after she publishes her first rec um, records of vocabularies he and she collaborate on a book called Australian Aborigines which um, remains by far the largest um, lexicon, uh, grammar and phraseology of Gunditjmara and Japwarang um, languages in existence pretty inaccurate, I'm sure, but the point is that it does not um, add up in terms of a scientific inquiry. Uh, it's better to think of it as the diary of uh, a set of uh, conversations that were left unfinished. A second important relationship um, is with um, a, uh, a Japwarang elder who has various names. Uh, in one version, he's called uh, Kawan Kunawarun, He's also called Hissing Swan. He's called King David. Uh, he becomes a close friend of Dawson's. And in fact, there's an opera written about him, uh, which Dawson commissioned. It's pretty amazing. And Camperdown, it was performed in Camperdown and taken to Warrnambool. We're still trying to track down the sheet music, but it's there. Um, he becomes an extremely important uh, collaborator. Uh, 
on this project, with all the ambiguity that collaboration had in the wake of the Umarala Wars, in the wake of the um, terrible events that happened on the Convincing Ground near Portland, um, these guys get together and uh, they, they work very closely to understand between them uh, not what was the past of indigenous culture, but what uh, it has to tell um, largely the white settler community and also the next generation of Aboriginal people about the principles of uh, a creative region, a region that can be demonstrated to operate at every level uh, as an integrated um, mechanism for taking care of country. And it really are some quite remarkable articles that Dawson publishes in sort of mainstream um, journals like the Argus and you know, the Australasian and so on, where he will say, Sir, I beg to draw your attention uh, to um, what um, the um, original and continuing possessors of this land say about the Pleiades. Fair enough. You know, and, and it, off he goes, and he tells them exactly what they have to say about the Pleiades. And he knows, and um, his, um, his workmen know that what's being told here is not, oh, here's a little bit of information about the stars. Uh, what is being told here is about a specific constellation <coughs> in relation to a specific set of biota, animals and birds, um, the rising and falling of the Pleiades corresponding to particular patterns of of uh, nesting and migration and so forth. Um, so these two relationships um, are important. But then there are also, uh, <coughs> and these relationships, I might say, become very entangled. So uh, an Isabella Dawson appears, um, an Aboriginal uh, um, girl who uh, takes on their name, uh, James Dawson emerges. And that's a quite, as you know, quite a common process of doubling which is an indication of community <coughs> emerging, an attempt to try and work out some protocols um, of accommodation between um, an invasive culture and one that's seeking to, to rationalise it. Also, uh, he is defined by a set of interests, which I mentioned before, uh, a set of relationships and a set of interests. Um, his relationships, not only with his intimate community, but also with the white community at large, are fascinating. Um, if um, the indigenous elders who cooperate with him are collaborators um, in the ambiguous sense that always associates, is always associated with the native informant, James Dawson has a similarly ambiguous relationship with um, the uh, policy makers in Melbourne. He has very good relationships with the, uh, the Von Gerards of this world. He commissioned Von Gerard to paint Tower Hill. Um, he also, in a remarkable moment, gets one of his Aboriginal um, Stockman to paint Von Gerard painting. So that was so that's quite a nice little bit of, pay, bit of payback there. Um, his interests extended then. Uh, primarily there were issues about social justice. Um, he was a lifelong um, um, how can we say advocate of uh, a humanitarian understanding of indigenous cultures and what what um, uh, wreckage had been caused by invasion. He um, went out of his way, as I've indicated, to try to bring to a broader audience, but including um, indigenous people, uh, the fruits of what he had found out from those people who worked with him about uh, ways of life, about um, medical practices, about philosophical understandings, above all about kinship and uh, family practices. Um, he did that not as an ethnographer particularly, but as a humanitarian. Um, he did it um, in almost as a perfect exemplar of what Karl Marx wanted an integrated um, social producer to be. In other words, he worked from his senses towards a sensuous understanding of his human environment. In other words, I think this is really probably the critical thing, is that he integrated his feeling of pain or suffering or pathos um, into his knowledge. Sense produced um, concepts and the concepts came back as ideas that functioned to make sense of the context of what was happening. It was absolutely historical understanding. In contrast with the scientists who were around him who were very keen to uh, absorb Aboriginal people into mission stations, um, 
Dawson was a great enemy of mission stations. He was uh, continually going on about um, how boring they were and how you know there's nothing happened in these things. And people who were perfectly able to look after themselves were being treated by chil as children. And uh, he was very active in Framlingham. He was very active um, in uh, going around basically the, the Victoria, writing highly critical reviews of what was happening in these places, um, trying to get better conditions. Um, even within that sort of compromised situation. But what was interesting was that um, in that process of trying to um, connect his own feelings, his own empathies, um, to make sense of his senses, um, he managed to remain, um, it seems, able to connect all the different parts of his life. And I suppose, in a nutshell, what doesn't happen when we have compartmentalized knowledge um, is that connection between um, feeling, sense, making sense, and concepts. If you maintain that progression, then feeling starts to generate a set of relationships between all the different fields of a region, fields of inquiry. They start to define an integrated sort of ethical um, understanding of the world and, of course, a practice. It does not lead to what happens so frequently in scientific knowledge, which is resentment. So resentment is very much what happens when we impose a system, as indeed people tried to do on the Kulin nation's uh, language. Resentment set in when it didn't conform to a scientific model. And then they would say, uh, the natives have a remarkably meagre syntax. <laughs> and this is resentment. So resentment against the very thing you thought you loved, which was an example of scientific fragmentation. He never went down that path. And as a consequence of that, he was able to integrate his passion uh, for human justice with an equally strong passion for environmental conservation. Um, he is responsible for commissioning von Gerard's painting of Tower Hill, which, as many of you will know, subsequently became a um, a point of reference for revegetation and biodiversity practices in that part of Victoria. He was also responsible for establishing the Mount Rouse, um, or the, the, the pre-national park version at Mount Rouse, and he was uh, untiring in telling through the columns of the newspapers uh, fellow squatters uh, how badly they were damaging the land, telling them about their fencing. He even undertook an independent experiment to look at um, salination um, in the Western District and he was very um, adamant that um, uh, groundwater was, was um, receding as a result of bad practices. All of this stuff he did off his own bat. Uh, he was merciless with his gun. He used to go around shooting everything he could see. He'd stuff it. He taught himself taxidermy. And he opened a public museum in Camperdown for the benefit of the public. Um, so, you know, he wasn't, he, wasn't just a, he wasn't too good to be true. <laughs> Uh, he was also an animal activist. Um, he, he led um, <coughs> campaigns against cruelty to animals very much in, you know, he would have been very much at the forefront of what's happening with live animal exports. Um, he was continually um, advocating for protection, particularly for cattle, from cruel practices. Um, <coughs> above all, he was committed to public education. He was committed to public education for his region. So he didn't attempt to tell people what to do in Gippsland or indeed <coughs> up in the Mallee. He, he radiated outwards from his property. He moved from uh, the, f the, the far low western district up to Camperdown. Um, the, f the previous uh, property sort of, sort of failed. Um, I'm not quite sure. I haven't quite worked out what the financial situation was. But it was a little bit like a second bankruptcy. And I think it was good for uh, Dawson. Um, I'm sure Dawson had read the Communist Manifesto, as we all have, and uh, somewhere in there Marx says that every time there is a, uh, an economic change in one's life, it produces a social revolution, and it certainly did for Dawson, because it caused him to leave Scotland and embark on this migrant career, but it also, when he left uh, Kangatong, which was the first property, it caused him to come back to Camperdown, where he was able to embark on these philanthropic activities. So I want, what we're finding is a man who's both a collaborator and a saboteur. Um, he was on the one hand uh, trying to uh, make common cause with peoples um, that he did not pretend uh, to have um, uh, particular rights to speak for. Um, he thought of them as neighbors, 
uh, very much in the way he would have thought of neighbours in a Scottish village. Um, he seemed to be completely devoid of the conventional um, social Darwinist racism. Um, he just took them as he found them, and what he found was uh, um, individuals who added up to a community that um, he basically um, uh, came to regard as exemplary in the ways that they responded both to each other and to the challenge of change. So his productive life then was a life that was an integrated um, relay between sense, uh, concept, and bringing it back into sensuous production. And that's how he held together all these things. I went to talk to, to uh, his great-granddaughter the other day, and she showed me the scrapbook that survived from... Well, they did have a lot of fires down there. Anyway, they, I don't know why, but anyway, they, so his, his, his public museum burnt down. I uh, thought, why it burnt down? It was actually above the fire station. But it burnt down. <laughs> so, so anyway, you know, and he was very proud of his otter. He, he, he killed an otter somewhere in Scotland, stuffed it and brought it out, and that was the core of his collection. But anyway, it all, all went. Um, he had quite a lot of stuff in there, which he probably shouldn't have had too. Um, he didn't know what people might think about it later. But anyway, it got, got, got burnt or destroyed. But in all of those processes, he used to say, he held together this common core of humanity. Uh, and humanitarianism is somewhat, in our post-humanist environment, is somewhat um, disregarded. But his capacity to be a common human being, to hold together all these different interests without some irritable desire to understand and possess and control, but rather to create, through his work, and the scrapbook illustrates it, an incredible miscellany of related interests so it's a literary style as well, the style of a miscellany. Somebody who works from local instances which touch him and then starts to produce concepts, acts on those concepts, starts to produce social change. Um, as I say, he's not only a, a commissioning artist, he's commissioning uh, um, opera writers. Uh, he um, commissions an extraordinary monument to one of his indigenous friends. Uh, he had been out of the district when this man died and Dawson was deeply upset by the, the lack of um, respect paid to his remains and puts up this immense obelisk in the graveyard outside Camperdown. It's a unique monument. Um, he's tireless to try to hold these things together that are falling apart all around him. So what is then, what, what is this thing, this creative region then, when it's put through... How am I going for time? Should I just stop? Second? Five minutes, five minutes, okay, on your buses. What is this thing that he's producing in relation to that creative region when, it, when it's sort of channeled through the individual life of this man? I think what he's doing is he's producing uh, a distinctive form of place-based knowledge. Um, it's a knowledge which is it's, it's situational. Um, again, it is exemplary in terms of its responsiveness to uh, the engagements that um, he finds on his doorstep. Um, he responds openly, he responds uh, passionately and constructively to the evident uh, human injustices and more broadly um, the senses of destruction he sees all around him. So he's both highly progressive, he's highly reactionary. He's progressive in the sense he foresees the destruction that's happening um, and he remembers it from what he's been told. And he's uh, also reactionary because he wants to arrest the rate of destruction. So in terms of the climate, uh, climate change debates, he both wants to um, find an accommodation with change, but he also wants to, uh, to mitigate change, if you like. Is that, that double edge? So he both um, wants public education to encourage, uh, again, very Marxian, to encourage uh, a leisure which is socially productive, but at the same time uh, he cries out against the waste, the sheer waste of, of human potential, um, and also for uh, the disregard of the spirit lives of, of non-human nature as well. So that is situational knowledge, and as I say, it produces this incredibly animated skein of interconnected interests. Um, and behind it and within it and through it is the unspoken, ununderstood, so far, relationship between him and Isabella, who is at the dark heart uh, 
um, of this whole regional knowledge. It's to her uh, and the fascinations of the gendering of the knowledge that became available through her uh, discussions with uh, the children that were now uh, female adults that she'd grown up with becomes a, another part that, um, you know, uh, we will probably need other people to help us to understand how that all works. The second thing that was very important, this brings me to the subtitle of the talk, is that situational knowledge or place-based knowledge is essentially the capacity to speak the place. And the real burden of this vocabulary was not to classify, to reduce and produce something that could be taken away and spoken in Manhattan. It was actually to, to show that these, uh, the, the people who were contributing um, nouns and adjectives and verbs had an endless discourse, that it would, just, it would go on so long as the conversation went on. It would continue to exfoliate and produce more nuances and more possibilities. And so um, he makes a great point, Dawson does, in the publication, that in contrast with the, uh, the white maps, which have so few names, and all of the names are so generic, um, the indigenous peoples of that region had names for everything. And it wasn't that they couldn't classify. They knew what a river was when it was necessary, but generally speaking, they also had a name for when a river didn't flow, as well as names for individual billabongs, individual um, rocks, as was necessary. It wasn't that they just um, charted the place unnecessarily. They charted it functionally. Uh, that is to say, they made connections that functioned. Now, he's making that point in the 1880s. Um, we understand, perhaps, um, the importance of being able to, to speak be able to name, uh, bring the place into being through names, I hope we do. But he understood speaking the place as the key to belonging, the key to being able to live there, and more importantly than that, the key to being able to produce the place. So it wasn't about just putting up on your gatepost some Aboriginal words saying, you know, um, I live at such and such, and thinking therefore that made you, you know, true Aussie or whatever, uh, nothing like that. And that's the case of Wurrung. So he, for some inexplicable reason, he knew perfectly well when he made his second homestead outside Camperdown uh, what indigenous words were for habitation, village, you know, for the stone huts and all the rest of it. He understood perfectly well all of that. But what he chose to do instead, instead of using wurrung, he used wurrung. And wurrung is um, the word you find on japurung or jajawurung, that word on the end there, which essentially means lip. It can mean lower lip or upper lip, I understand. But why would he call his house? On his, on his fence, it said Wurl. Well, not Wurl, I say. Now, why would he call the place where he came to live at the time that he was working on the on Australian Aborigines, on the vocabulary, you know, which is a 100-page vocabulary in three different dialects, uh, together with grammar and syntax, why would he call the place where he worked and lived lip? And it appears that he called it lip because he was well aware that it was a word in these languages that also referred to flowing. It also refer referred to the, to the lip of a waterhole. It referred to a weir in the river. It referred to a, a place of fluid change, a place where something was expressed and where, therefore, something fell out, was collected, and moved forward. So that Wurung maybe, this is my speculation, uh, had something in his mind to do with the relationship between a talking place and a place where um, an essential element for life, as Badger was pointing out, uh, were pooled. But what was pooled there was not simply uh, an ecological relationship. What was pooled there were connections that functioned, connections between living, between social production, between the intimate act of speaking and listening, of inclining and reclining. These were connections that functioned. So what I wanted to do this morning in the context of this, uh, this symposium, mine was certainly free range eggs. They don't really come from any particular discourse. They bring together little bits and pieces of 19th century history, little bits and pieces of local history. Um, some reflection on the poetics of placemaking. What I wanted to bring to you today was the thought that in addition to the social and political mechanisms we need in order to improve our capacity to make decisions 
about the futures of our environments through the various means of collaboration that we've heard about. It also involves remembering people who've already shown us the way. And Dawson is exemplary in that fashion. But he's exemplary because he wasn't a scientist. He wasn't an artist. He wasn't even, in a certain sense, an intellectual. What he was was a, a sensuous producer of the real. Uh, for him, there was no difference between being socially and producing a world in which things made sense. And that was his primary task, to make sense of things. And what if it came along, he made sense? Unless, of course, it was running, in which case he shot it. Which that would have <laughs> but provided it, it, was, it sort of lay still and, you know... But indeed, but the point of that too, when he, when he went out hunting, it was not for the gratification of the kill. It was for public education. It was actually part of his conservation policy. Um, if they could have you know, museums of stuffed animals in the major cities of the world, why shouldn't they have one in Camperdown? If they could perform operas in Milano, why couldn't they do it in Camperdown? He was a great... Um, had a great, very developed sense of Italian, say, campanilismo. You know, he's, he really believed in his own sort of church tower, basically. Um, so I recommend him to you as a contribution to thinking about uh, a creative region, such as we have here, and a reminder that there are particular um, avatars, there are particular people um, and spirits who are very strong. And one of our tasks is, is in terms of inventing a better future, is, is to remember them. Thank you.